So I'm going to be reading the intro to Erica Kennedy's book. Um, as many of you know, Erica Kennedy was a bridesmaid for Kamora Lee Simmons. And she wrote this book, which is allegedly loosely based on uh, P. Diddy and a lot of people in the music industry. And about a decade or 10 years after, you know, this book being published, she was found dead and the circumstances surrounding her death are still a mystery today. On June 18, 2012, the Miami Beach, Florida Police Department confirmed to news media that Kennedy's body had been found in her home on June 13. She was 42 years old. Kennedy's cause of death has never been publicly announced. Now that is strange. Here's the intro. Lamont Sonnert into the grill room like he owned the place. Mr. Jackson, the maitre d' greeted him warmly. Mr. Green is waiting at your usual table. Lamont gifted him with a courteous half smile. Their usual table was the best one in the Midtown Manhattan restaurant where the power players converged. A dark skinned man with an imposing build and a cocksure swagger, Lamont Jackson was not conventionally handsome. Rather, he had that well-groomed sheen particular to rich, image-conscious men. He cut a formidable swath as he strode through the room in his favorite Briani suit, chin up, acknowledging fellow members of the media elite with friendly nods, the masculine scent of his Bulgari cologne lingering in his wake. He derived a soul-deep satisfaction from being watched, being known. He felt their eyes upon him as he approached Irv Green, the 66-year-old chairman of Augusta Music, who had been ranked number 10 on last year's Entertainment Weekly Power 100. After his own record label had achieved its best year to date, Lamont had landed in the magazine's annual honorable mention spot at 100.5, an insult. He would have preferred not to have been mentioned at all. Lamont consulted his Patek Philippe as he slid into the booth. Am I late? Irv Green was a stickler for punctuality. It was something he and Lamont had in common. No, Irv said cordially, not bothering to get up right on time. They enjoyed a warm professional relationship. There was no need for formality, though if Lamont had arrived first, he would have instinctively stood to greet the music industry legend. They ordered lunch and made small talk until Irv finally addressed the unspoken topic hanging in the air. I'm just going to pause right there. From what this, these couple of paragraphs, this short portion here, I'm feeling this is Puffy, allegedly in my mind, and Clive Davis. I don't care what you say, 66, a uh, top record person. This is giving me the relationship that allegedly they had. Okay, so that's just me. You guys come to so it's true, he announced between bites of salmon. Really, Lamont attempted to sound surprised, even though rumors have been swirling for a month. They want you out. Yeah, Irv said, the fuckers. He leaned over in a confidential whisper and said, so everyone already knows, huh? Well, not everyone. What are people saying? Listen, Lamont said, HMG can't ask you to step down. They have no cause. None, Irv agreed immediately. It's a forced retirement. He was reconciled to the fact that he was being pushed out as the head of Augusta, where he had been cranking out hits for more than 30 years. What bullshit, Lamont spat, truly outraged. Even at 38 years old, as the CEO of Triple Large Entertainment, the hip hop label he founded in a joint venture with Augusta, this is clearly Diddy and uh, Clive Davis, in my opinion, Lamont was feeling the heat from younger moguls in training. Bullshit it is, Irv sighed. But we operate in a world that worships the young and exiles the old, he shrugged. He'd been wrestling with the dilemma for a month and had to let go of the anger. Technically, Lamont had to report to Irv, but only, mostly, he was the master of his own ship. Irv wasn't going to tell Lamont, an African-American who had the pulse of the urban culture, how to run a hip-hop label. Irv had been one of Lamont's most vocal supporters to the higher ups at HMG, the German conglomerate that owned Augusta. The same fuckers who were trying to push Irv out of his job. You remember the first time he had lunch here, Lamont reflected? Nine years ago, when we were working out that joint venture. I remember like 
I remember it like it was yesterday. I said you had on jeans that were too baggy, Air Jordans, a yellow hooded Morehouse sweatshirt, and you kept taking calls on a cell phone that was the size of a brick. I was embarrassed to be seen with you. My mom didn't want to be reminded of that, but remember what you said to me that day. People were just starting to realize hip hop wasn't a passing fad. I said the Germans at HMG were racist and the only reason they wanted to get in bed with me was because green was the only color that could blind them to my own. Irv nodded. And I said, I'm a Jew from Carnissi. You think they like me better? To them, we're both niggers. Accept it and move on. They both chuckled at the recollection. It was the best advice I'd ever gotten, Lamont said. Still is. He'd learned so much from Irv how to handle corporate politics, how to groom and break an artisan, even how to dress. Lamont looked at Irv now, casually attired in a white shirt, no tie, what was left of his dark brown hair elegantly slicked back. The shirt was so crisp, so sturdy, so blindly white, it almost had a celestial glow. Where did you even buy a shirt like that and how much did it cost? You also said, Lamont continued, the trip down memory lane to massage Earth's ego. You make hit records. We all make money and everyone's happy. A thoughtful pause. You've been producing hits for 35 years, Irv. You've made them a lot of money. You're still at the top of your game. It's not right what they're trying to do. That's what everyone's saying. Irv smiled and raised his glass in appreciation. So what's next? Lamont asked casually. Self-serving to the bone, he was more curious about what the shakeup meant for him than his mentor. <laughs> That's not my thing, Irv said. Might start my own label. I can write my own ticket. A differential, of course. And they're still deciding on my replacement. The pause was so pregnant, it was expecting triplets. Say it, Lamont silently urged, say it. Irv Green looked across the table and smiled genuinely. If it were up to me, the job would be yours today but I do know you're at the top of their list. Lamont leaned his considerable girth back on the leather banquet and pushed his plate of risotto away, taking a moment to compose himself so his deep baritone would not sound too eager in reply. He felt like jumping up in the packed dining room and shouting, I'm ready, but he only shifted slightly when he spoke. He sounded cool and calm. You know, I've been thinking of branching out, he said doing some R&B shit. I have some things in the works now. Wonderful, Irv enthused. That's what you need to do. Show the Nazis you're not a one trick pony. Irv wiped his mouth with the cloth napkin. There's still a lot to be worked out before I leave. Everyone's going to be watching you, Monty. Show them what you got. Show them what you can do. As soon as Lamont hopped into the back of his Mercedes, as soon as Lamont hopped into the back of his Mercedes Maybach, he called Daryl McHenry, his all-purpose whipping boy. They had already spoken about the brilliant idea that had come to Lamont last night. Daryl was just waiting for the word. Lamont had three for him. Call the girl. So, just with that little bit right there, I am getting that it's Clive Davis. For one, we know that Clive Davis, I think his career started either in the late 60s, early 70s. So, given that this was written like probably in the 2000s, we know that this person uh, had, the person that Lamont, and so I'm, I'm assuming that Lamont is Diddy. So we're, I'm just gonna say, when we're talking about Lamont, allegedly, and this is, you know, this is speculation, this is just what we're thinking, that Lamont is Puffy, and the Irv is Clive Davis. Now, Lamont is black. We know that from this. And Clive Davis is Jewish. So just the banter between the two of them leads me to believe that is, I mean, really, the names are different, but the, the similar similarities are just uncanny. When you look at the history, I mean, Clive has been in the business 30 years, and that would have been about 30 years, you know, when this was written. He was at the top of his game. And um, if you guys remember, Clive Davis was actually ousted from one of his, uh, his positions um but that was back in hmm i don't have all my notes i don't have my notes right here but but clive davis 
was fired from CBS Records in 1973 for allegedly using company funds to bankroll his son's bar mitzvah. Columbia, Record, Columbia Pictures then hired him to be a consultant for the company's Bell Records label. And then Davis took time out to write his memoirs and then he founded his own record company, which was Heirs to Records in 1974. Now, if you go back and you read some of the old um, clips, newspaper clips, uh, he was accused of not only using company funds for his son's bar mitzvah, but for other things as well as um, assisting or funneling drugs to some of you know the artists so and he's been affiliated with a lot of artists that have died under his tenure okay um un under his tutelage i should say so um i'm really feeling that this person is loosely based on clive davis so jump in the comments and let me know what you think so far if you think these two characters are based on Diddy and Clive Davis. And I'll see you on the next chapter. Bye.